welcome to the Ghosts of Harrenhal. My name's Simon. And I'm Jenny, or rather, McKelly. Thank you for joining us for episode 190 of our chapter by chapter book review of A Song of Ice and Fire by George Martin. Today we'll be discussing chapter 46 of A Storm of Swords, that's Sam 3. And as always, we're going to chat about the chapter, we're going to try not to spoil any future plot points for you, and hopefully we're going to provide you some entertainment along the way. We'll summarise what occurred, discuss our thoughts on it, provide some useful background, compare it to the television show, indulge in a little pedantry, and cover some relevant news and listener correspondence. Be sure to check out the show notes, they'll provide some additional information about the characters and geography of this chapter. How are you, McKelly? I am doing well. It's good to be back. Well... I mean, you'd like to be welcomed back, but you know. It's, it's good to be back. <laughs> Before you were permanently replaced. Right. I had to hurry back. <laughs> oh, I, I just want to, I just want to quickly thank Jenny for, for stepping in, doing such a fantastic job. And I don't think, I don't think most people, probably anybody, but the three of us realize on how short of notice she stepped in. It was less than a week. She was called up, and she did a, a very admirable job. And oh so. yeah, yeah, she she did great. I, I I have to say, I think I've said this a couple of times. I think I've said it to you. I I'd forgotten how nerve wracking it could be, because oh, yes. for you and me, this is just like you know, it's just we do this all the time, right? But. Jenny was kind of nervous and it rubbed up on me. I was like, oh yeah, this is quite nerve wracking now I think about it. I'm sure. Yes, I'm sure. Uh, I knew she was nervous going in. I, I was talking to her beforehand and uh, she she seemed nervous, but I was like, it's going to be fine. You're going to do great. And she did. Yeah, and it, it really helped me out. You know, as you mentioned, I was, I was visiting my mom who's, who's not doing great. And, um, you know, it allowed me to not have to worry about us you know, suddenly just missing an episode at the spur of the, at the at the last minute, and uh, yeah, it was really. Great. I'm not sure you were totally not worried about us. I felt like there were texts arriving just before, during, and after to make sure it had all gone swimmingly. So I think you were still I, it, worried. I wasn't worried. I was just wanting to be there for support. I was curious. I was interested. I couldn't wait to to hear. And <laughs> I listened. I listened. Um, Sunday evening, while I mostly while I was folding laundry, I got to be like a, a listener. I, I uh -huh. got to I get to tell you what I was doing while I was listening. I was folding laundry for the most part. <laughs> That's it. That's what you're supposed to do. <laughs> and I don't know if our listeners uh, deal with this, but I was talking to you guys the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know if it was just just because I'm used to doing this. Or if it was, this is what normally happens, but I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, no, this, what about this? Wait, what about this? <laughs> uh, you lunatic. I know. Uh, that was, that I, was fun. While we were sort of warming up and practicing for it, because we had to do all kinds of like, we had, we had a little contact all the way through the week up until we recorded. I right. got to meet Mr. of Old Stones, which is very, oh, very nice. Yeah. Okay, yeah. cool. Yeah. That's, that's good stuff. Yeah. Uh, I did find out this weekend, uh, I, I have a new overlord, um, King Charles the something is my new... Uh, well, you did. You're an American citizen now, right? Yeah, but I, I, I'm not allowed to give it up. I'm still oh, a subject really? of the king. I didn't yeah, know I'm, that. Well, the, the US wants me to give it up, but the British won't let me give it up. Oh, okay. Because you're not a citizen, you're a subject. Right. So it's not optional. You, you're his subject and you are for life, you know. You'd think that the two nations would have sorted that out by now. They sort of have. It's kind of like a tacit, you know, the Americans say, give up your other citizenship. You say, sure. The British say, no. And everyone goes about their business, you know. Okay. Okay. Uh, but uh, I'm not much of a royalist. Uh, I know. I'm not. Yes. Yeah. But... It, but but I'm, but I'm also kind of like passively disinterested. It's not like I, I, I'd be there, you know, at the foot of the guillotine calling for their heads or anything. I'm just, you know, I just think it's archaic and ridiculous, you know. Okay. I discovered my brother does not have my calm demeanor about this. He was absolutely furious about the whole thing. Oh, okay. Yeah, I mean, just the cost and the ridiculousness of it. Yeah. And... And also some of the things, he was talking about some of the ceremony. Some of the ceremony goes on behind closed doors because it's really weird. <laughs> it's like, like, 
chickens, headless chickens and such. <laughs> I think more weird than that. I mean, there's like the the Archbishop of Canterbury rubs oil into his chest or something, into the king's chest. Oh. That's I did weird. not know about that. Yeah. No, you're not supposed to. That's all the sort I of secret so. stuff that right. goes on. So yeah, my, my brother was uh is definitely definitely gonna try and overthrow those guys. <laughs> I I have to say, the, the I've said I've said this to you before. The one thing that I think it has an advantage over the American system is that your fig your head of state figurehead is apolitical. Right. The US has a political president who is the head of state. And it means that all the time half the people in the country don't like their head of state and right. their head of state doesn't like half of the country right sure and, and so it's very polarizing uh-huh. if you have an apolitical head of state you can have sort of like that sort of like well we all support this person right kind of a, but we don't uh, yeah, yeah. i mean not a mediator necessarily but a common ground that everyone yeah. can walk on Right. Well, there are much better ways to do it. There's there's like the Irish system. They, the political parties don't stand for president, just individuals stand for president. And so you end up with a president who people like, you know, like that might be a, a poet or a playwright oh. or something like that. Oh, wow. And and, and they they act like a figurehead, but you still have political parties standing for the parliament and the parliament is the one who actually sets the law. So you still, it's not like you're giving away your democracy. It's just you're you're separating the politics from the country. A little sure. bit. Sure. Right. Right. Well, without you, it's always a slow news week. So that's all I got. <laughs> true, well, anyway, true, true. let's get down to business. How do you believe Samuel Tarley? It's been an awfully long time. I've, I've forgotten to count back how many chapters, but it's been a long time. I'd actually yes. forgotten that he was a POV character. <laughs> that's how long it's been. You I forgot. Was stunned. I was like, Sam three? What are you talking about? Uh, last we saw of Sam, he and his Nightwatch brethren were hunkered down at Craster's Keep after evading or in Sam's case, dispatching the others and their whites on their flight from the Fist of the First Men. Many of the Night's Watch men were sick and dying. Most of the brothers thought that the culprit of this was malnutrition, and Craster was only giving them wheat broth and scraps to eat. When Craster's new son is born, Craster gives the Black Brothers the heave-ho, but he'll feast them before they go. At dinner, things turned ugly and mutiny erupted. Craster and Lord Commander Mormont are killed. Two of Craster's wives beg Sam to take Craster's wife Gilly and her newborn son and flee before the others show up to take the boy. McKelly, why don't we give a summary of this one? All right. Well, Sam, Gilly, and Gilly's unnamed baby boy are making their way south trying to get back to Castle Black. They've come across a wildling village that Sam hopes is White Tree, but he's not quite sure. The trio have had to circumnavigate hills and lakes, so he's not sure of their location. Sam has been on foot for a long while after one of their horses died along the journey. He's sore, tired, and frostbitten, but he's afraid to ride share their lone horse for fear his weight being too much for the horse. They've set themselves up for the night in a timber hall, and Gilly has a fire going to warm them. Sam paints a lovely picture of the cosy life she and the baby will have when they reach Castle Black, complete with warmth, food, and sun. Gilly asks Sam to sing, and he obliges. Afterwards, he's reminded of how his father forbade him to sing to his baby brother Dickon, for fear of making Dickon as soft as Sam. Despite the cosy picture he painted of Castle Black, he has no clue what he's going to do with Gilly when they get to the castle. She keeps offering to marry Sam, but as a black brother, he knows that's not an option. He's been putting it all out of his mind until they get there. He lays down with Gilly and the baby and imagines telling his father of him killing an other, of his new moniker Sam the Slayer, but his imagination isn't strong enough to envision his father reacting in any positive way. He drifts to sleep and dreams he's the Lord of Horn Hill, hosting all his black brothers, even the dead ones like Lord Commander Mormont. He wakes to incredible coldness and sees a large shadow move near the entrance flaps of the hall. The shadow becomes the hulking figure of Small Paul. Sam's dead brother has the piercing blue eyes of a white. Sam instructs Gilly to get out while he distracts Paul. He prays for braveness, at least enough to let Gilly get away. When Paul looks toward Gilly, Sam makes his move, attacking Paul with his dragonglass dagger. Unfortunately, the dagger shatters on Paul's male armor. His regular dagger is equally ineffective. Paul's black, cold hands close around Sam's neck. 
Sam realizes he's about to die. He jerks himself toward Paul and, and the pair tumble to the ground. Sam grabs a stick from the fire and jams it into Paul's mouth. Soon Paul's face bursts into flames. Outside, Sam takes in the horrific scene. Whites are everywhere. Some in wildling furs, others in night's watch blacks. They're eating the horse and have Gilly and the baby surrounded by the weirwood tree. Sam notices that there are ravens and lots of them. Hundreds to thousands sit in the branches of the weirwood. Suddenly, they descend on the whites, pecking and clawing at them. A raven that had landed on his shoulder says to go, go, go. Sam runs through the whites, who are distracted by fighting off the ravens, and grabs Gilly. Unsure where to go next, Sam hears a man shout, Brother! A man wearing mottled blacks of the Night's Watch sits astride a huge elk. He helps Gilly and Baby onto the elk. And when he reaches for Sam, Sam notices that the man's hands are cold and black and as hard as stone. Okay. So, obviously, that last bit is going to be quite a subject of uh, conjecture towards the end of our discussion. But right now, who the heck was that? (laughs) Some geezer just rescued them? I think it might be Radagast the Brown. (laughs) I like it. (laughs) <laughs> all right, so let's be methodical. Uh, uh, okay. First of all, I'm going to say it's amazing to me that they're still alive. I mean, on some levels it's not, but really that they've stayed alive this long is quite incredible because Gilly, she's had a hard life and everything, but riding for apparently weeks uh-huh. after just giving birth, uh-huh. terrified for your life, uh-huh. at the pace of a walking stout man... <laughs> <laughs> that's just next level i mean she must True. be absolutely exhausted i had thought about the pace <laughs> they have <laughs> sam is not exactly fleet of foot <laughs> when you talk about that he must be losing weight hand oh, over fist that's here. true that's very possible right because yes. he's frozen cold and that burns calories better than anything else being cold oh sure yeah and he's getting no calorie intake basically I mean, they're, right, they're eating little. like, yeah. So yeah, the, just the little bit that Gilly's sister wives yeah. were able to uh, pack up for them. When he eventually gets back to Castle Black and sort of peels off his big robes, he's going to be like buff Superman. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> just walked halfway across the continent. <laughs> yeah, uh, we talked. we talked in the last Sam chapter at the end when they started this trip from Craster's Keep to the Wall, about how she had literally just given birth, either, I think right. that same day. Right. And now she was hopping on a horse to escape and how difficult that would be. I'm not going to compare my own wife to Gilly because it's not fair. You know, different circumstances, different people. Sure, slightly. But I don't, yeah. think, she, I don't think Carson could have done it. Well, I don't know. It... It, I'm sure you can if you have no choice, but it, boy, it seems, yeah, it, it seems nearly impossible. But again, I, I wouldn't know firsthand, but quite it, yes, it seems very challenging yeah. at the least. But they do seem to be lost, and that is despite the fact that Sam was making maps of the terrain on their way north, and it just goes to show you that cartography is very different than orienteering i guess yes very true <laughs> but especially given sam's failures with sort of keeping his, his bookkeeping is not up to snuff yet i think he'll get there but remember he sent a bunch of ravens to castle black with without messages right yes he did <laughs> perhaps that came in handy right now when they when they all gathered back here to save him but... <laughs> that's right <laughs> that's where they all came from <laughs> we didn't know where to go we didn't have notes on us or anything so we've just been circling above you for for months <laughs> but i'm really worried about the frostbite i mean that's the other thing you know, oh, he's yeah. clearly developing sure. frostbite and you can lose significant parts of your body to frostbite and right so I'm hoping that whoever the uh, sa- savior is has some warmth and food for them. Yeah, wasn't Garrod from the prologue of a Game of Thrones? Wasn't he missing half a nose or something uh, like that? He was he missing something to, yeah. from Frostbite, and I think yep. Steer, the the Magnar of Then, is missing his ears from Frostbite or something oh. along those lines, right? So, 
yeah. yeah, it's a dangerous thing. You don't want to be messing around with it for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And especially, especially, I think he's reached a point of desperation where he isn't taking care of it. I mean, I'm sure that part of the Night's Watch orientation is looking for the signs of frostbite yes. and how to prevent it. And Very clearly, Sam is not taking care of it. Right. He, yes. You know, because they're in such desperate straits here. Yeah. But uh, so peppered throughout the chapter, we kind of get little nuggets of Sam's life growing up in Horn Hill. Yeah. I, I will say, actually, when he thinks back on it, that it isn't terrible. It is quite, it, it has moments of idyllicness, in fact. Yeah, tenderness and love from his yeah, mother he, and he, sisters. From his mothers and sisters really loved him, and he was sweet to Dickon when Dickon was small. Right. Uh, but it's just ruined by the presence of Randall Tarley. Lord Randall yep. Tarley, his father, is just, uh, he is a mean-spirited monster who never respected Sam and mistreated him horribly and and denied him the pleasures that he wanted you know he's he's obviously a a gentle natured soul and he wanted to sing and dance with his sisters let him do it yeah it's it's really sad to think about the treatment that sam received from his father and you know clearly his father was disappointed that he didn't get a warrior hunter type like like randall and you know but his actions and behavior surely hurt sam very deeply and you know he probably spent a lot of time wondering why can't i be the son that my father wants so right. there's a line when that that sam thinks about that he, he's something like um they were sing uh, sam and his mom were singing to baby dickon mm-hmm. and randall tarley their his father bursts in and says you know knock that off you ruined one boy with these soft septon songs and then yeah. he turns to Sam and said, you must sing, go sing to your sisters. I don't want you near my son. And just, just, mm-hmm. just saying it that way is, is painful enough. Yeah. It, uh, uh, do, do you think, obviously some of this feels like the actions of a father, of, of a, a unpleasant father towards a son who turns out to be gay. Now, I don't think Sam is gay because I think he kind of likes Gilly and has had a right. soft yeah. spot for her. Yeah. But um, is is he denying his true self, do you think? Do you think Sam is gay? Oh. I, I'd i never thought about it. I, it's, very, it's possible. I, I mean, it does seem like he in some ways fancies Gilly, but at the same time, there's no clear evidence that he does, yeah. you know. So uh, it's it's certainly possible. Yeah. What one thing but, is but, for certain, go on. is that his treat his treatment at the hands of his father likely plays a huge role in his lack of self confidence. Mm-hmm. For sure. He, yeah. He absolutely. doesn't. His father's all. You know, when he's dying, when he's getting choked out by the white of small Paul. He, his last thoughts are of his mother who loved him and his father who he failed. So yeah. his whole life, he's thought, I'm not good enough. I'm a coward. I'm useless, you know, and that that all stems from the treatment his father uh, yeah. got I, gave him. I, and I mean, reg- regardless of Sam's sort of orientation, it's his nature. It's clearly uh-huh. not his upbringing. I'm sure Randall Tully tried to bring him up to be a warrior, to be a fighter, and he right. just it, his nature was not that. So right. all the more reason to to despise Randall Tully because yes. you're hating the kid for what he instinctively is, not because of what he's choosing to be. Right. Sam would yeah. love nothing more than to make him happy, his father happy. I agree, agree completely, and and I I get that the Tarleys are marcher lords, and that's a a region known for strong martial tradition. And I'm sure it's ingrained in the mentality of the family, you know, fighting and military prowess, but it's, it's absolutely no excuse. You love your kid for the sweet natured kind person that he is. Yeah. So yeah, it's tough. Yeah. And I, I, I will agree with Sam that likely his father, you know, he, he envisions while he's falling asleep him having a conversation with his father and telling him, you know, like I, 
I killed another. My brothers call me Sam the Slayer, and he he can't even imagine in, in, that his father could say, think, or say anything positive about it. And, and he's probably right. right. You know? The only thing he could think of was that his father would assume that it was just a, a lie, a story that right. went around. Yes. Yeah. Yes, uh, his father would uh, be not impressed, and uh, you know, although. He probably would assume it was some sort of uh, accident or something that if he did <laughs> did believe that he killed the other, which technically it it was right. But, <laughs> you know, and and even his nickname Sam the Slayer is mostly done with jest by those of his brothers who don't believe. So, yeah. you know, his father wouldn't be the only one who it's finds it a bit of a stretch. But it's true. It's just it's just really hard. It breaks my heart to to yeah. hear about the treatment he faced. So. Let's 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 assume let's assume a positive outcome here. What's going to happen to Gilly when they get back to Castle Black? Because I've racked my brains here and I'm struggling to find much good. I mean, I don't think they employ many women. I don't think they employ any women. Basically, to avoid the temptation of having women around, women around. Right. right? Yeah. So she can't stay at Castle Black, and he can't marry her, which yeah. she keeps proposing. And and then that's sad in its own right because. Gilly keeps saying that she'll be his wife if he wanted. And, you know, she's raised in an environment where marriage wasn't consensual, but forced and ex- and expected to her her father, which is a whole nother level of terribleness. But uh, there, there's no thought about whether if she's actually interested in spending her life with Sam, she just thinks, I'll marry you if you want me to, because I guess that's what I'm supposed to do. So, yeah. but anyway, what are the options uh, you know, possibly set her up in Moltz Town. I know a good haberdashery that might be in need of a sales clerk. <laughs> yeah, but but how does he set her up? You know, he's got yes. nothing. I mean, he can't exactly write to Horn Hill and say, "Hey, can you send some money to set up this girl that I found north of the wall?" It, right, Absolutely. as a rival no, no. rival haberdashery. Yeah, I, I thought maybe she could work in a tavern. Uh, you know, then I would I'd worry about her in an unknown land with a baby's son as naive as she is and she's never been anywhere outside of craster's keep so it's it's just certainly a scary situation probably less scary than she would have been in had the others shown had she waited around for the others to show up <laughs> but still it's a well, uh tough situation. I, I don't know it would have been a simplified situation if everything had gone to craster's plan you know she would have been childless and back in the rotation pretty quick. oh right right yes Yes. So Sam has a dream, and as always with dreams, I turn to McKelly Ray, the dreamer, <laughs> the, dream. the dreamer amongst us, <laughs> to interpret and explain. Well, I will say Sam's dream is very much of his fashion. You know, he's hosting his friends to singing and dancing and feasting, and there's no mention of any tourney or display of fighting or weaponry. Hunting. Right. There's there's no finger dance like the like the Iron <laughs> Islanders do. There's no Dothraki wedding deaths. There's certainly no debauchery that would take in place at Robert Baratheon's feasts. Uh, so it, it's very much a Sam Tarly dream. And I think it's beautiful and I love it. Um, as far as the dream goes, I think it's really just a fantasy that he he everything everything he wishes for would come true. Yeah. He is the he is the head of the the Lord of Horn Hill, and it's a a peaceful, open, loving, embracing environment. And all of his friends, even the ones that have died, are there, and everyone's dressed in colors instead of all blacks. And then Gilly is waiting for him in bed, which does, as we were saying earlier, does possibly tend to uh, lean toward him fancying her. True. Harking back to last week, which I know you don't have first-hand knowledge of last week's episode, but we were talking about what document Rob Stark was having notarized at the end oh, of the yes, thing. Oh, yes, and, I heard. And basically, the idea was that it was uh, something that was re-legitimizing Jon Snow and hopefully freeing him from his uh, Night's Watch oath. But maybe... It what it didn't mention the name. Maybe it says this document entitles the bearer to be relieved from their Night's Watch oath, and so maybe Sam can get hold of it, okay. and he can get out of there. 
I that like a, it. Yeah. That was a lot for a tiny little payoff right there. <laughs> but I liked the payoff. Yeah. <laughs> so the other thing for Sam here, I mean, man, Sam does not need any more things playing on his psyche, but the, the extra trauma of the of the white that gets to him being small Paul, who was uh-huh. the guy who carried Sam, and right. as a result of carrying Sam, fell behind and fell outside the circle. And therefore was killed by the others. So yes. Sam was, I mean, I don't like to point the fingers. I hope Sam probably doesn't listen. But um, <laughs> <laughs> he's responsible for his death. And now, you know, if you're responsible for someone's death, I'm sure that person would haunt you forever. But right. he's literally there in the room trying to strangle <laughs> you. You know, that's... Yes. <laughs> He's physically haunting you. <laughs> yes, you're you're absolutely right. It is Sam's fault that Paul fell behind. So that it probably would. And then Sam kills the other right after Paul dies. Oh, but you so couldn't even just save done that. Paul. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so so surely his death weighs on him. Oh, and that that was a that answers a question that I had actually, which was at the time it was like. Do the whites that were created by a given other die when that other dies? Good. Yeah, that's a good question. Clearly not, because because small Paul oh, was killed by the yes. one that Sam killed. Right. Yeah. Uh huh. So that mystery is solved. Well, I yeah, even, I mean, hadn't thought about that. I don't know if anybody else thought it was a mystery, but on our show, it was a mystery. <laughs> We just created a mystery so we could solve it. <laughs> right. But I, I, I'll just say, okay, Sam pees himself at the sight of small Paul. Who am I to judge? Uh, uh, you know what? I'm pretty much guaranteed to pee myself the first time a zombie grabs me by the throat <laughs> yes. too. Aside from that, he shows some serious bravery. He, he tries to protect Gilly and the baby by keeping Paul focused on him. Uh, You know, he moves, Sam actually moves away from the fire because that's the direction in which uh, Gilly and the baby are. So he's, he's distancing distancing himself from something that might be useful in order to help protect uh, Gilly and the baby. And he, he clearly, he just doesn't understand what bravery is. He thinks bravery is not being afraid, but in the famous words, of Eddard Ned Stark, you can only be brave when you are afraid, which is clearly something his super brave father, Sam's super brave father, never bothered to teach him. Yeah. I will say that, you know, there are physical manifestations of bravery, and one of them is not peeing yourself. I mean, so... (laughs) (laughs) So... (laughs) He is... (laughs) He is doing things that would continue to sort of lay on his mind the idea that he's not very brave, yes, even if his actions, whilst having wet pants, are quite brave. <laughs> right, that's, yeah. that's that's true. He thinks with a clear head. He makes a plan to get the baby right. and Gilly to safety. Right. Right. He puts the focus of danger on himself, and then he faces down that danger. Yeah, yeah. So that he peed himself is just it's just a small blip. Otherwise, right. he was very brave. I agree. Aside, I mean, so then the, the the struggle happens between Small Paul and um, Sam. There's really not a lot to say about it, except for that it still doesn't tell us if the dragon glass is effective on whites. Because, because he never actually stabbed him. Yeah, yes. He kept on, he, he chipped the dragon glass on his armor. Until, until nothing it was, was left. Until nothing was left, yeah. So, um, I, unfortunately. I, I wondered the same thing if, if we had any confirmation of that not Go yet Marge. okay so when he goes outside then help me understand something mckelly why did these birds attack the whites outside it feels like okay i have no idea maybe birds north of the wall just instinctively don't like the white walkers and their whites and just attack them but it feels like something more was going on here was yeah. it the elk rider was he guiding them? The the one bird that talked to Sam on his shoulder feels like it was Mormont's bird. Yeah, it certainly was talking, which is what Mormont's bird did. Yeah. But Mormont's bird made it to Craster's Keep and died with... Well, it didn't die there, but 
Mormont died there, and that's when the bird became uh, ownerless, I guess. But we know it didn't die there. Because if I was actually having sort of an insurrection against Lord Commander Mormont, I wouldn't want that bird to get back to Castle Black, where it might say, that guy killed Lord Commander Mormont. <laughs> that would be the smoking gun, exactly. <laughs> the smoking bird. <laughs> you want some corn? <laughs> Shove this corn down. <laughs> oh, it was still alive at the end of the at the end of the okay. Sam chapter. That's right. all we know. Um, yeah, so I don't know that it was Mormont's bird. It it doesn't necessarily feel like it is, although it was talking. But yeah. Uh, so, but real quick, let's just set the scene here. Like set the scene for me. Okay. Well, it's this scene gets very zombie movie vibe, but with a twist of fantasy elements that are. A little bit rare to A Song of Ice and Fire. I mean, you know, well, so much of A Song of Ice and Fire is rooted in like medieval politics and real life struggle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Of course, dragons and others aside. Yeah. Um, Come on, get but, to it. He comes out, weirwood tree, right. gilly, whites everywhere, tree full of crows. Yes. Ravens, ravens. So here we have, right. you know, whites, which are quite a fantasy element. But then we have these ravens defending the living from the dead and the raven that you're talking about that's on sam's shoulder says to him go 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 and then there's a man mounted on a 10 plus foot elk which has a little bit of lord of the rings vibes if you think that that's why i said it was radagast oh yeah Brown i know why you said that yes <laughs> but um but so when they're still in the in the hall before when when Gilly and Sam are both still in the hall with Small Paul. Gilly says they came they smelled the baby. They came for the baby. The baby smells uh, like because they think the baby is theirs because of Craster's deal. Well, so yeah, so like what were the whites going to do with the baby if they got the baby? We know as you said, we know Craster's deal with the others for the sons, but were these whites going to take the baby back to the others? Do they have oh, the yes. mental faculties for that? Would the because, others trust them with that job? Because there was no White Walker here. Although, although that's interesting, though, because I Sam wakes up and it's very, very cold. That made right. me think there was a White Walker present, but he never mentioned seeing one. They only mentioned seeing whites. Maybe the White Walker was not there yet, but why would uh, a White Walker be behind these slow-moving whites? I, I don't know. So... Tortoise well, and a hair thing. He's taking a nap right. back down the road. Yeah. <laughs> Were they going to eat the baby because it smelled so strongly of life? I, it was unclear what was going right. to happen because it never did happen. If if they're under any kind of control, they might take the baby back to their White Walker, you know. I guess. that that That's some special uh, care that they're putting in those whites, so, you know. Swaddle the baby and carry it back to the yeah. other. I don't. Does the baby need to be alive? I I don't. I don't know. No. But yeah, I don't know. Anyway, and, and then also there were several other black brothers that were part of the shambling mob. There was right. Chet yeah. was mentioned. Lark, oh, the Chet sister was man, mentioned. was mentioned. They were both part of the mutiny group on the fist that from the prologue that uh, never came to fruition. Okay, yeah. so I just wanted to get all that stuff mentioned um so yeah so then who or what is the savior and he's got hands of a white but he talks and thinks and there's there's these ravens that are defending the humans which feels like a warging kind of yes it does it feels so is he warging all the whites i mean all the whites is he warging all the ravens that would be very handy actually would if you could warg the whites get them to do what you want (laughs) yes well maybe maybe someone's warging him maybe he is a white and someone is warging him he's got he's got stone cold dead black hands just like whites yeah and i I read one interesting theory about this uh, that so we didn't mention the song that sam sang to gilly but it was a it was a lullaby but a uh uh Faith of the Seven Lullaby, which basically has six verses for the six uh-huh. uh, faces of the god that aren't the stranger, because uh, 
Gilly mentions you only sang about six. I thought there were seven. Right, right. And he's right. like, yes, we don't we don't sing about the stranger because the stranger is death, and you know we don't want to sing about that to a baby. It's a, a little ghoulish. <laughs> I will say, if you look at a lot of lullabies that we sing to our children, they're pretty ghoulish too. So right, you know, just, ring around the rosy, anybody? Exactly, exactly. <laughs> so, um, so I did hear one idea that the guy on the elk was actually the stranger. That oh. basically they'd invoked his name, and there they were, right on the verge of death, and the stranger decided to intercede on their behalf. For okay, some yeah, maybe he's tired of not being included in the song. Exactly. So yeah, you, you know, he gets every them on one that of you elk. sings that song. I'm going to come <laughs> over and, in your case, I'm going to save you just because you were in dire straits. But generally, I'm going to be mad at y'all. <laughs> he gets them on the elk, and first thing he says is, "Hey." How about one of you add a verse about the this yeah. little rescue mission here? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and the stranger probably gonna take you to death, but you never know. <laughs> the stranger arrives with your last rites, but sometimes saves you from deadly whites. <laughs> Look at Kelly your Ray, where did that come from? He Genius. brings his ravens to the fight, and his elk whisks away all the little children. <laughs> You should see his face right now. <laughs> you, what How's week that off? verse? What do you think and of that verse? That's brilliant. I mean, that should be in there for sure. Uh, uh, I like that, though. The manifestation of the stranger. Yeah, that's yeah. a neat idea. I it? get the feeling we're going to find out in the next Sam chapter who this person is, and it isn't going to be that. But just the way he rides in at just that moment, having they mm -hmm. just had that conversation about the stranger. Yeah. And let's be honest, they are a heartbeat away from meeting the stranger for real. Oh, yeah. Right, right. Now, yeah. about the the ravens and why they're defending the humans here, you, again, like you said, it, it certainly feels like a warging situation. And we have seen we we've met characters who can warg more than one animal vermeer six skins who john yes. met he rides a snow bear he wargs three wolves a shadow cat and he seems to have taken over the eagle that oral uh, was warging with so uh by the way i love the idea that he's warging is like some just juggling act and he's constantly <laughs> warging like he can only actually walk two at a time. <laughs> as as it's about to eat him, he walks that one. <laughs> right. Releasing one of the other ones, he then tries to eat him. He's like, <laughs> it's like spinning plates. <laughs> yeah, and then we've got this huge elk. It's gigantic elk that this man is mounted on. Maybe maybe he maybe this man is warging the uh ravens and the elk, you know? It, the elk yeah. must be, it says, the description says it's 10 feet tall at its shoulders. and it, But it is carrying this man, Gilly and her baby, and Sam Tarly. And Sam has already figured that the previous horse died because of his weight. So it must be a huge elk. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty close to inconceivable, but. You know, given what's just gone on, I think we right, can probably yeah, yeah. turn a blind eye to it. He's um, wearing he's wearing um, blacks, Night's Watch blacks, right. but Sam and, doesn't seem to recognize him. So, but he also calls him brother. Yes, right. So but he he could okay, be so, from the Shadow Tower or East Watch yeah. by the Sea or. All right, but I have a suggestion for you, which might be a spoiler because I honestly don't know if this isn't it. <laughs> okay. But there is a brother of the Night's Watch who's been north of the Wall long enough to become to have become feral to have become basically a wildling by any other name who perhaps has been north of the wall so long that he's got frostbite of the hands so his hands are cold and black and who sam tarley would not recognize because he went north of the wall before sam became a brother of the night's watch and by your face i know you know who i'm talking about i am talking uh, about yes. one benjamin Stark. I am nodding along with you because the, all that does fit. Yes. I, yeah. We we certainly don't know. We don't get any name or any description that might give it away. But uh, yeah, that, that certainly... All the things you just painted would fit this guy and Benjamin Stark. Now, that doesn't mean that they're one and the same. No, no. But... It could be a wildling who rides elks who stole Benjamin Stark's cloak or any other member of the night's watch's cloak it could be an oddly high functioning white 
Could be a white that's being warged. A white Maybe. that's being warged. Exactly. As you suggested. Yeah. Yeah. Well, hopefully we'll find out in about 70 chapters time when Sam gets another <laughs> POV. <laughs> Ready for some background? I sure am. Let's do it. So there wasn't a great deal of background to go on in this chapter, but Sam does spend some time thinking about his life back on at Horn Hill. So some of I, this... the, the yes? For the alliterative question, I should have done towns because it's much easier. You know, right, places. It is. You know. <laughs> um, so some of this I think we've probably talked about before, but I believe that some of this is new as well. So just... Uh, just so everybody knows, Horn Hill is the seat of House Charlie. It is located in the foothills of the Red Mountains in the Dornish Marches uh, of the Reach. And as legend has it, the castle was built by twin brothers, Harlan the Hunter and Herndon of the Horn. They were the sons of Garth Greenhand, the mythical High King from the Dawn Age. But there's an interesting story about these brothers. They both married a beautiful woods witch who lived atop the hill that the castle was built on. And it seems, as the story goes, that the brothers didn't age as long as they engaged in relations with her during a full moon. And it's said that this went on for a hundred years, and so began House Tarly. But one other noteworthy bit from the Tar Tarly family that I've just mentioned here is Sam thinks of his mother. And he thinks of stories that paint her as a really sweet lady. Well, Sam's mom is Melissa Tarley, formerly Melissa Florent. She is the middle child of Alistair Florent and Melora Crane. So the last we saw of Melissa's father, he was in deep trouble by King Stannis and Melisandre for high treason. And of course, her father, Alistair, is on the opposite side of the war, as Melissa's husband Randall is, but I imagine she'd still be upset to learn of her father's mm. current circumstances. That is interesting. I did, I did not realize that. Just yeah, tying so, it all together. Yeah, yeah, so his grandfather is Alistair Florent, but yes. his father, obviously, is Randall Tarley, so yeah, two sides of the same thing. So, yep. uh, not to sort of like you know take this down to the base level but did they did the twins have to sleep with her at the same time <laughs> that's a good young? question i wondered that too it did was they unclear take alternate full moons you know right oh. yeah they gain every other month they gained a little bit of age maybe imagine <laughs> you might want to dispatch your twin brother just because you could have 200 years you could have oh, lived to be 200 right. if you just got rid of yeah. the other one by the way every name in that particular background was alliterative it was weird oh, yes it is yeah. garth greenhand harlan yeah. the hunter Exactly. Of the, of the horn. Yeah. All right. So comparison with the television show, there's a bit of a deviation here. Sam and Gilly and the baby are together in an abandoned wildling village. Yeah. Okay. She is the only one capable of lighting a fire because Sam's hopeless. I believe they that also was the case, right? In the, <laughs> in the book? Yes. Yes. Well, yes, exactly. They are attacked by, an, by a white walker, not by a uh, white. Okay. Uh, Sam dispatches that White Walker with the dragon glass. That is where Sam kills one. So he doesn't, none of this Sam the Slayer stuff happens because this is the only, un unless Gilly teases him mercilessly from this point onwards. That could be, <laughs> that's, where it, that's where it gets its origination from. <laughs> uh, the crows are in the tree, but they don't seem to help. Uh, they did make <laughs> useless. <laughs> they did make noise, noise to warn them. Um, okay. Some use. So, but I have a question about that. Didn't the forest go quiet way back in the prologue of Game of Thrones? Didn't the forest go quiet at the presence yes. of the White Walkers? Yes, I believe you're right. Mm. That was part of the thing, the reason that Garrod and Will were so unnerved. Yeah, yeah. So obviously these birds were doing something outside of the normal for animals when in the presence of right. a White Walker. Yeah, right, right. Yeah. Uh, the cold handed elf jockey. <laughs> <laughs> The cold handed elk jockey is skipped. <laughs> <laughs> and I will say that in the book, they say, Gilly says they don't name their children for the first two years because of the high infant mortality rates north of the wall, particularly among boys. Um, yes, I, it did. <laughs> but Craster boys in particular. It also made me wonder would she actually know any boys' names? Oh, right. Yeah, that's right. You'd be like, what the heck? 
What do you call a boy? I don't know. They're all dead before they're two. Why why would we go? Boy, yeah. Uh, in the show, Sam mansplains the concept of last names and they spitball ideas for a name for the baby. So that okay. happens. Okay. Uh, pedantry Corner. I didn't really find anything, but it's a shame because I, I actually had the computer out when I was typing. There were only six verses in the seven in the Song of the Seven Gods until Gilly asks the same question and uh, Sam explains they don't sing about the stranger. So uh, I imagine my disappointment when I had to backtrack all that. I yeah 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 that's you delete 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 yeah exactly <laughs> <laughs> yeah I I don't really have anything I do that must be one huge elk I will say that <laughs> because that's three of the them... part of this chapter that you can't get past <laughs> <Yes. laughs> <laughs> well the rest of it's all mythical and magical right so but the elk <laughs> the that just doesn't make any elk. sense. How tall is this elk? I mean, they have little spindly legs. He's got like 800 pounds up on there. <laughs> Sam's already killed one horse. <laughs> you, can have a, you can have that much weight on an elk. He needs at least six legs. Right. All right, news and notes. Okay, so uh, George Martin has been quite vocal in his support of the WGA, the Writers Guild of America's strike that recently has, has uh, begun. Uh, He's also uh, explained the impact that the strike will have or not have on some of our A Song of Ice and Fire related shows, so I'm going to fill you all in. First off, he ensured everyone that House of the Dragon Season 2 shouldn't face much of a setback. The scripts have already been written and rewritten many times over, and although script writing does happen during the, you know, production of a show, they're pretty well baked. Uh, so that shouldn't they should be able to carry on with production of season two of House of the Dragon, uh, you know, while this strike is happening. Unfortunately, the upcoming Duncan Egg show won't be as lucky. The writing process has come to a halt while the strike is ongoing. But he has also reassured us, a Song of Ice and Fire fans, that the WGA strike doesn't include novel writers. So. He'll still be working on Winds of Winter. And, you know, maybe a silver lining to this whole thing is possibly he'll be less distracted with these Hollywood projects that he has gotten himself wrapped up in. Maybe focus on the book a little more. Mm -hmm. We'll see. I will say um, the Writers Guild of America uh, strikers did have some well-written signs. Uh, oh, I, I bet I, they did. I, I saw one that said, pay us what you owe us or we'll kill off your favorite character. <laughs> I, I like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, so there's another Game of Thrones alumni headed to the Con of Thrones in Orlando, Florida. Indira Varma, who played Ilaria Sand, Paramorta Oberyn Martell, will be in attendance. Uh, she's she's a lovely lady. Uh, uh-huh. We recently met her when the Red Viper outs- arrived outside of King's Landing and Tyrion was there to greet them. Uh, Con of Thrones will be held August 25th to 27th, and we are considering attending. You never know. It could happen. Right. We need to yeah. talk about that and actually make a decision. Just stop stop teasing without actually right. thinking about it. Yeah, Because <laughs> we don't want to announce, we're going, and then yeah. we're like, yeah, we're yeah, not. No, no. <laughs> we're too lazy to go all the way to Orlando. Oh, that's in Florida, right? In the summer? Oh. In the... Right. Why would they do it in summer? In Orlando. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, In exciting news, we have a new uh, Knight of the Realm sustainer on Buy Me a Coffee. NSM Saint is the name. So thank you so much. We look forward to interacting with you and chatting with you on the sustainer calls that include our Knights of the Realm. So Excellent. Very exciting. Yes. Yeah. Welcome. Uh, We're looking forward to meeting you. Absolutely. All right, let's draw a line under this one. Um, hopefully Sam and Gilly have found a savior because honestly, I cannot see Sam getting them to the wall in one piece any other way. I mean, I get it without maps right. that he lost somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> it's We've hard. Lost over that bit. <laughs> right. <laughs> oh, it's not that hard though. Just keep going south, you know? But, but actually, one thing they mentioned in this, which, which freaked me out, am I right in thinking that the Eye of the Dragon of the constellation is uh-huh. due north. I believe so. Yes. So that this is a huge constellation because he talks about this coming. The that he used the dragon, the tail of the dragon, to help guide him south. And that doesn't necessarily mean it's due south, but it means that's a huge constellation. I guess so. 
Yeah, yeah. I just That's thought true. about that. Um, yeah. uh, but, yeah. And if they do get to the wall, what next for Gilly? I, I'm very worried about that. But maybe maybe everything's just going to get derailed by Elk Boy. <laughs> Well, if they do make it to the wall, and, you know, if if it hadn't been for the, as you put it, elk jockey, um, possibly Sam would have missed the wall altogether, even though it spans the continent. <laughs> well, I see this seashore here, but I could have sworn there should have been a wall. <laughs> Shouldn't we have reached a wall before we reach this water? <laughs> um, it, but, uh, you know, we are assuming that this guy is going to help them get home. He could put them in a hole and make them put lotion on their skin twice a day. No, no. They could be going out of the frying pan into the fire here. Wait, you mean they're going to crown him the King of England? (laughs) Uh, As far as Gilly, uh, when she gets to the wall, uh, we'll put her to work. She can come work for us. Yeah. And and we we will make fantastic surrogate uncles to this baby boy. We would. We would. We'll help her with the name choice <laughs> right you'll you'll teach him Sivas. yeah 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 and, gilly uh, there's more than just salmon craster i'm telling you there's more than salmon craster right uh and it's time for sam to stop calling himself a coward let's be honest uh-huh. absolutely he's he is so much braver than he thinks he is he just yeah. needs to get his bladder under control a little better and he will be rocking and rolling yeah and fingers crossed that we found ourselves a hero in the nick of time. Yeah, yeah. And don't be surprised if Gandalf shows up in the next Sam chapter, possibly. <laughs> that would really be, really just tie it all together. <laughs> uh, where are we going next? Uh, next week, we are off to visit Arya. And I'll say she discovers that the Hound has a different plan for her than she assumes that he has for her. And... He gives an idea of his next possible career endeavor. Exciting. I'll give you a hint. Think Septon. No, I'm joking. That would be ridiculous. (laughs) (laughs) All right. There's three ways that you can help us. You could leave us a positive review. You could buy some merchandise at ghostofharrenhall.threadless.com. You could buy us a cup of arbor gold at buymeacoffee.com slash ghostharrenhall. Uh, become a sustainer at the Knight of the Realm or Lord Paramount level as NCM Saint did. And you can uh, meet us on video calls and uh, enjoy other benefits as well. That's right. And you can always reach us at ghost.harrenhall at gmail.com. But go on out and follow us on Twitter, at Ghost Heron Hall. And we're on Facebook, Instagram, Discord, and YouTube. Thank you for listening. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Oh my god, you've done it again.